All right. Well, we can get uh, started with this mid morning session. So, the first talk here is uh, using IFAS at the Bend Water Reclamation Facility to provide an effluent total nitrogen less than three milligrams per liter. So, Chris Miklas with the City of Bend uh, is the manager of the City of Bend plant. Uh, he has over 19 years uh, of wastewater treatment plant operations experience at both the City of Bend and the City of Redmond. And then I'm also talking on this paper, and I'm uh, William Leaf at Jacobs and have uh, been in the industry for about 25 years. So with that, so we'll, we'll split this up a little bit today. So a little bit about the agenda. I'll just kind of cover the secondary expansion project and details with, related to that. And then Chris will jump in uh, to talk about the startup and commissioning and some of the ongoing operation uh, efforts that they've, they've done out there. And you can see we have some, you know, sub bullets that we'll cover as we get into it. So a little history about the plant. You know, the initial project was initiated to increase capacity at the facility. Uh, it historically was a six and a half MGD uh, plant at a conventional activated sludge, uh, MLE type process. They do have an effluent discharge out to some evaporation ponds. Um, and so they have a total nitrogen limit of less than 10 on an annual average basis. So, so one of the, you know, there's a few folks now in the, in, in the, in the Northwest that have these total nitrogen limits, but, but Ben was certainly one of the first. And then we did incorporate an IFAS in, system, uh, integrated fixed film activated sludge. So we kind of also had a goal for that to just, you know, get us an ammonia limit less than, or a, a treat to an effluent ammonia of less than one uh, during wintertime months. They have a class A reuse facility, about two and a half MGD. Used to send that to one of the local golf courses, uh, but now looking at, you know, some other uh, opportunities they might have. Uh, they have anaerobically digested sludge, treat to a class A level after some drying beds. And then you can see the chart there, their current kind of max month flows. So the flows are, you know, kind of approaching that historical capacity and the, the loads have certainly gone up over the past years as, as we'll chat about. So the secondary expansion, even though it, the name was secondary expansion, you can see that we added some primary treatment as well. So additional primary clarifiers. As I mentioned, we have the integrated fixed film activated sludge process that was incorporated, uh, a new aeration basin, and then the modification of two existing basins. New blower facility feeds those bioreactors, uh, UV disinfection, and then you can see there's some additional improvements at the facility. Uh, most of those kind of geared around increasing the hydraulic capacity, even though uh, you saw that they had some lower, uh, or that six and a half MGD flow is what they have now. Uh, they do get some rain on snow events, and sometimes those really can hammer the facility. So the one to be able to pass that. So uh, apologies to anyone on the live stream, but I'm using a laser pointer to highlight the plant here. So this is a construction aerial photo from a few years back. This is their headworks facility. They have some fine screens in there. And you can see we move on to the primary clarifiers with the new one that was installed. Um, you can see it's not in operation as it is bright green from the lovely floatables. Um, and then they have the four bioreactors. So this one on to the right of the screen is the new uh, aeration basin four. So aeration basin two, three, and four were populated with the IFAS system. Then from there onto the secondary clarifiers and then a new UV disinfection facility. This is the reuse facility where they have some disc filtration system. And then on the solids handling corner of the project, they have the anaerobic digestion process, thickening, dewatering. And then this is just a portion, the drying beds are actually to the beyond the picture to the top of the screen. Uh, the Bend facility is located about six miles east of town proper. So kind of out there, you know, in the desert, uh, in the basalt area. So. So a little ways from town. So most of the, uh, the flow that gets there is all pumped, really tight system, and a lot of new construction and a, new, um, a lot of new breweries in town. So there's a lot of just new growth. So just a little bit about the IFAS system. So it's configured at the Bend plant and essentially a four-stage barn flow process. So you can see our pre-denitrification zone and anox, anoxic selectors followed by the first aerobic cell, which is populated with the IFAS media. 
Then we have another aerated cell. Then we have a swing zone. So both a non-aerated and aerated zone, then a tiny little polishing step prior to clarification. <clears throat> so it is, as folks are probably aware with the IFAST system, it is an intensification technology. We're essentially combining some benefits of both the biofilm and that suspended growth biomass to provide the treatment. Uh, IFAS, you know, historically was common in North America compared to say it's sister of an MBBR, which is a pure biofilm based technology, just, you know, take advantage of the, the activated sludge systems we have in the States. And most of the implementation of IFAS systems have been driven by the need for either you needed to nitrify or potentially improve your total nitrogen limits. So. So this, I'll just pop through here. So this is just a little slide that describes a little bit more about uh, the IFAS system. So you can see there's some uh, biofilm carriers, the little plastic media, and that supports essentially a nitrifying biomass, which is independent of the SRT of the bioreactor. Because the suspended biomass, we essentially keep that SRT low so that it's you know below what you typically could nitrify with. Um, and then there is a, you know, we, I don't know if we haven't quite quantified it, but, you know, there is some thought that we're definitely kind of seeding those nitrifiers in the suspended growth system with the biofilm. Um, so kind of a side benefit, but we definitely, you know, not something we include uh, looking at the design process. And then this is a chart that kind of shows, so the, the, the bottom axis there is the temperature in uh, degrees Celsius. And then the axis, uh, the vertical axis there is the suspended biomass SRT. So that's, I'm sure you've all seen this curve. That's essentially the classic, you know, for the aerobic SRT that you need to nitrify. The EPA generated these curves, you know, back in the day. So from a design perspective, you know, historically the industry, you know, we would find a design temperature, you know, you know what kind of that minimum SRT is you need for nitrification. And then folks would apply a safety factor to make sure we met it. You know, and certainly with some of the innovative technologies, you know, this little dated uh, at times now, but the takeaway from here is you can see all these operating IFAS systems. You can see the majority, if not all of them, operate below this minimum aerobic nitrification SRT. So they're all operating kind of below that washout condition where the, the nitrifying biomass can form. And you can see bend right here, about a four day SRT, about 14 degrees C. They're kind of right on that line of just, you know, typically where you wouldn't have reliable nitrification. Uh, so a little bit about some of the components. Um, you can see we have some plastic biofilm carriers. So usually there's a, there's a certain percentage fill volume that you can put into the bioreactors with those. Uh, they're a high density polyethylene. And then the sizing is based on the effective specific surface area. Basically the inside of that media is what, and so, and so there's, there's a number of you know, manufacturers out there, but that's how they're sized and how you determine how much media you need, essentially figuring out that effective specific surface area. Uh, we need retention screens. So unlike the talk we had earlier about the CANAF, these media stay in the reactor. So they don't move around, they're fixed into one little reactor. And you can see there's some retention screens that essentially hold the media within and the mixed liquor passes through. And then the bottom part, the other piece of the puzzle is the aeration diffusers and oxygen supply. So it's you know, essentially a stainless steel coarse bubble system. Uh, the IFAS world refers to it as a medium bubble because you have a little differing efficiencies given the, the media in place. And then from a design perspective, we look at carrying a relatively high bulk of DO, not necessarily where we want to operate at, as, as Chris will kind of uh, show, but um, we want to design there. So the unique thing about IFAS is that it's, um, you know, once you're able to penetrate the biofilm, um, it's a linear removal for ammonia, the more oxygen you provide. So, you know, in most of our suspended growth plants, you don't get a lot of benefit above two milligrams per liter with respect to nitrification. In an IFAST system, you can really drive that nitrification more with more oxygen in the reactor. Um, and then in addition to that, um, it helps keep everything in suspension and mixed, so. 
And then these slides just kind of go through the, the layout at Bend. So again, they were uh, outside of the new basin four, these were repurposed basins. So the anoxic zones that you see there, cells, uh, cell A, I mean, those were from the existing layout, just a classically designed selectors uh, for the MLE process. The gray area is the IFAS zone. So the water comes into that. And then cell C is the following aerated zone. Cell D is the swing zone. And then cell E is that final polishing step. And this is just a little bit how the water gets in there. You can see the primary effluent comes into cell A. We do have a primary effluent bypass. So the, one of the challenges with IFAS, it is hydraulically limited. So you know there's a certain velocity that needs like forward flow velocity that those retention screens can handle. You can imagine all the media getting bunched up against one side if we have too much flow going through there. So during some of those rain on snow events, uh, we can send the, bypass, uh, the PE around that. Uh, and still get some good treatment. Then you can see our mixed liquor recycle pumps pulling from cell C back over to cell A3. And this next slide just shows, and Chris will talk how they've been using these, but uh, there's a number of uh, new instrumentation was included with the project. Certainly some DO probes scattered throughout, but you can also see we have some ammonium probes and uh, some nitrate probes uh, that the plants really found beneficial. With that cool part, Chris gets to talk about. So. All right, we had uh, quite a long startup and uh, you know, it's sort of a series of phases to the startup. Um, and I'll sort of break them down here. So phase one is when the aeration basin four was complete. That was actually a new con construction. So that was built on the existing, uh, off of the existing aeration basin. And uh, originally we were thinking we were gonna fill those with a 60% fill to, uh, or 40% fill to start out, but the decision, decision was made to do 60 uh, based on uh, how the, the project was pr progressing. Um, it, then, so after that fourth was built, then we were gonna retrofit three, but we'd still have access to operating aeration basin one and two. In phase two, we'd have, uh, four um, complete like was before, but uh, aeration basin three would be brought online. Um, but with that, we were going to have to take one and two off uh, out of service because of a channel that was going between both of them. So to refresh, retrofit two, we were going to have to lose the ability to operate one and two. Um, so we'd be just running to, uh, all I fast at that point, but uh, only two basins. And then the final phase. Um, completion of aeration basin two's retrofit, and then uh, um, able to uh, split that media evenly between all three IFAS zones and all three aeration basins at 40%. So this gives you a little uh, picture of uh, what it looks like empty um, on your right. Um, and then on this, this picture here, you can see the the fur, the lowest uh, section of screens is actually covered here with the media. So this is uh, when we took aeration basin four down. Um, that's sixty percent fill. So that gives you sort of idea of what it looks like. Um, you drain out all the mixed liquor out of that uh, cell. So I just wanted to sort of light, uh, lay out what the situation was as we went into. Uh, um, startup of at least uh, aeration basin four. Um, we were in a situation that uh, in 2017, we weren't me meeting that annual cal uh, calendar year annual total nitrogen. Um, you can see at the beginning of the year, we had some very high ammonia uh, or uh, total nitrogen numbers, and that sort of um, you know, set the stage that we weren't going to be able to meet it for that year since it's a calendar year. Um, and then in 2018, um, we were looking like we were getting close, but then at the very end of the year, we had a very high total nitrogen um, for December, and that uh, that uh, put us in a, a bad spot for for meeting permit that year. But after that, you know, we got into the phases of the the project where we were able to bring those IFAS basins on, and 
you can see in 2019, at towards the end, we were getting uh, a lot better total nitrogen coming out of the plant. And then 2020, um, we're still finishing up the project um, even during, during that, uh, that calendar year. But then finally, um, we're com we've completed and got all three of the aeration basin um, retrofitted and uh, we did our per uh, performance testing that 2021 year. And then this last year, you can see some of the numbers. We've been, we're gonna, as we get into this, you'll see that you know, we're, we were really pushing some high DOs into the aeration basin. So we're trying to play with it and see, you know, uh, uh, play between using too much energy and, and uh, um, getting those better uh, total nitrogen fills. This is the other thing I was looking at as we went into the, the, the startup. Um, this is our groundwater monitoring. And I'll just point out uh, is the red, points here and the green points here. We do quarterly sampling of our um, groundwater. You can definitely see this trend up through those years where we weren't, you know, as you saw in the slide before, um, our total nitrogen um, wasn't getting there um, to the permit limits, but also we were seeing this trend of, in the groundwater monitoring starting to go up. And we're gonna go into a, a, a permit renewal, uh, we thought maybe in the near term. So. I really was concerned that once we went into that, that permit negotiation, they would be seeing this trend in our groundwater uh, going up that after we got the basins online that we really pushed them to probably help uh, improve that groundwater quality. So you can see now we've pushed it back down sort of pre-project um, um, numbers in the groundwater monitoring that we're, we're doing now. So. Um, it was really going into it. There's a lot of anxiety about, well, look what's happening here. You know, we really need this project to, to start putting out some, some good total nitrogen numbers. Uh, as, as Bill mentioned, these ammonia probes were essential um, to helping try to, to get that, the plant running optimally with what we had with you know, the number of operating basins. Um, and also we had, because of the phasing of the construction, um, we had some other obstacles I'll, I'll talk about a little here, but uh, uh, definitely the ammonia probes I leaned on um, really heavily. That ammonia probe is on the outfall of the IFAS, so I get to see what's happening ab um, about the nitrification occurring in that, that IFAS basin um, from you know, monitoring or trending that, that probe. So the lay of the land, again, I think he, he talked a little about this, but AB1, um, that's, that is empty now after the project's complete. So we retrofit, four was a new construction, three retrofit of an old aeration basin for IFAST, and then the same with two. And you can see this in this light gray here, that was that channel going between the two of them. So they had to cut out that channel um, to actually retrofit two. And that's why we, we couldn't use AB1 for um, additional capacity. Um, so uh, to do two, we had to, to retrofit two, we actually had to um, bring that uh, one, uh, one and two offline. So I make that note during our phase two of this project, when we got uh, two IFAST basins, we did lose a third of our, our volume of mixed liquor, our, uh, our aeration bit capacity. So going into to phase one, aeration basin four completed in 2016. Uh, then there was a uh, pause in the construction. The decision was made to, to do 60% fill, get a, a little more biomass in there to, to try to improve its uh, performance. The one thing that ended up um, occurring also is uh, the original mixed liquor recycle pumps were failing from just operating four. Um, so there was a decision made throughout the construction that we were going to bring in a new pump um, to do that. But based on that, we had these, these, uh, the, um, those mixed liquor recycle pumps that we we're having issues with in four that limited our return to uh, you know, 30%. We could, um, if we risked, if we tried to push the, the, the pumps harder, that they would fail, and then we'd have no mixed liquor return at all. So uh, the decision was made to run those at 30% during that time period. 
also with the construction of the new primaries, um, all the, the filtrate ammonia from operating our bell press, uh, dewatering of the anaerobic digester, we had two splitter box after our, our, um, our primaries, or for our primaries. Two were, uh, um, one, the old splitter box went uh, serviced uh, primary one and two, and then uh, the new splitter box, uh, or the new uh, primary uh, clarifier uh, was uh, going to the far side of, or discharge the far side of uh, um, the plant, or which is the aeration basin four. So the two of the two galleries, all the all the flow for uh, four was coming from primary three. One and two received all the dewatered ammonia or uh, the filtrate ammonia from the bell press. So when we were operating uh, AB four with all that media and and the ability to do the additional nitrification, all our ammonia from uh, um, with, from the dewatered uh, anaerobic digester would only go into one and two, which were not retrofitted yet. So where we could, you know, where we had the most capacity to, to handle the, the additional nitrogen, we couldn't get it to. It was going uh, to the, the MLE um, basins here during this phase. So we historically, um, would pump back into the, uh, the plant, the ammonia from dewatering um, in uh, over 24 hours. But with those ammonia probes, we were able to start seeing what was going on in the basin, um, but only in AB4 because they were the only ones that had uh, the ammonia nitrate probes. Um, so that, in the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little how we use that information to sort of optimize things during this phase. Um, we did really quickly, this last point, you know, I end up uh, finding out that, that the DO set points that we thought maybe more on the four range really had to be pushed up to the to, to six to, to maximize the, the nitrification in IFAS. So here's a, a, a little trend, and I'd like to point out a few things here. So in black here, here we go. This is our normal um, uh, uh, flow through the plant. You know, we have sort of two peaks and then a low through, through the evening and again through that cycle. The second thing I'll point out here is this is our, our, uh, our ammonia filtrate um, from digestion getting after dewatering, getting pumped back into the plant. And so you can see a, a couple different trends where it, and it just, it's on, the pump turns on and just, just pumps. So it just goes up to its max and just, you know, stays there for whatever time period we can, we, we dictate what we want it to uh, pump. These colorful uh, blue green trends here are the peak of ammonia leaving the IFAS. So when the every day when the, the flows come up, we get a peak of ammonia that's picked up by that probe because complete nitrification can't occur in that in that cell with the higher flow conditions. But after after we hit that high flow, the the um, IFAS system is able to start knocking down. This right here is probably about complete nitrification. Um, these probes at about two um, milligrams per liter really sort of fall asleep. Um, so you can see there's a little difference between the, diff the, the different basins about the amount of um, ammonia that actually peaks after that high flow. But the big thing I wanted to point out here is that even at low flow, so this is our low flow condition in, in the evening, and we have our ammonia from uh, dewatering being entered into the plant, the ammonia trend coming out of the IFAS is, is, is just flatlined there. So that's what we use to know that we, could, we can throw the ammonia from um, dewatering back into the plant in the evening, and the plant really even doesn't see it. 
and we, we don't even get a spike out of the IFAST zone um, in those evenings. And that's when we made the decision to let's start targeting in the evening when we know the plant can take it. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we started to do to try to get our overall total nitrogen numbers down. Uh, interesting thing here too, I'll point out here, this is just a couple of days ago, we had to run our uh, um, filtrate pumping of, of uh, ammonia uh, during the day or during the high point. And you can see we get this extra bump in the, the ammonia spike in the IFAS. So during the high flows, you know, it, you'll see a reaction by the basin of what it can treat, but during the, but if you do it in the evening during the low flows, we don't even get a bump in the, the ammonia uh, leaving the, the IFAS. Here's a, a little uh, trend to show you some of the um, ammonia set points. This is from just a couple of days ago. So this is uh, 4.5 as the set point in IFAST. We, uh, then they made a little adjustment to take it down to uh, 3.5. Um, so we're playing with that, trying to bring it down a little um, to try not to uh, you know, save a little uh, on energy there. The, the one thing I'll, I wanted to also point out, we got, again, we have uh, the trend of primary effluent going into the basin. Um, and then we have our pumping of uh, the ammonia filtrate from dewatering. You can see that um, there is some opportunities here. I'll point out here when the flows came down, when the flows came down here, and we're still pumping degas ammonia, even during that time, you can see our set point for DO is um, set up in a way that we even have we're, we're providing that much DO, but it, the DO is starting to drift up. So we're trying to bring down the set points that that actually um, are the minimum flows for air into those cells. We think we can save some energy there um, because we can see that we're providing more air than really is needed at that time at the low flows. Okay, so we're getting into uh, the winter of 2019. Um, this is our first try of performance testing. Um, in October, of uh, 2018, we added the 60% fill to aeration basin three. Um, it wasn't a great time of year to, to add that um, media, but you know, during the uh, it was uh, you know, delays in construction were just it, we ended up landing in there um, and and just made the decision to to add it then 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 wait till uh, maybe the next spring when it would be a little better. So at this point the that the primary clarifier has been uh, are, uh, completed and the piping to the new uh, splitter box is done. So now we can split the amount of ammonia coming back from, from dewatering a digester back into uh, all, three or all two basins. But we've lost a third of our aeration capacity um, from having to bring one of the, the trains down. Um, New, new, the new mixed liquor recycle pumps gave us total control of, of our mixed liquor return at that point. So that was a, a real big benefit. And, and that's what got us to the point where we're starting to meet, meet that total nitrogen limit again. Um, so during one of the, I think I, I failed to mention in one of the other slides, the loading uh, characteristics um, changed dramatically from the original design um, to what we were, were seeing um, as we were doing this startup. And that was sort of identified in this uh, first try at the performance testing. Um, you can see the numbers. This was the, the characterization in 2009 as the design was going into, into effect. And then here's our, our numbers in January and February of 2019. It's you know, a 91% 90, 91 in, uh, 91 increase for BOD. The soluble COD, you'll see here, that was a big deal also. And I'll go, you know, I'll talk a little more about that as we, we get into a little more detail about the performance testing, but also um, PKN dramatically higher than, than originally the design was. Okay, so challenges for um, phase two, uh, discovered loading was a significantly uh, higher. 
um, where we were getting uh, soluble COD going into the IFAS competing um, with the nitrifiers in there for the, the oxygen. So probably not getting an optimal performance out of the IFAS because of it. Um, based on those, those higher uh, loadings, um, the original performance criteria needed to be reevaluated. So um, we, that's the, another reason why we had to go back to the drawing boards and say, what was fair for expectations of, of this project based on the, the change in the, the loading to the plant? Um, so it phase, phase are uh, the last phase where all three aeration basins are now operating. Um, we ended up, we, we had a lot of challenges with moving the media around back and forth because we did 60% fill on the other two basins. So learning how to uh, move that media was a, a, big, a big challenge. Um, more here. So we did end up, originally it was one milligram per liter for average uh, or uh, for uh, during the winter. Um, we had to adjust that to three milligrams per liter. And uh, we do still struggle with poor SVIs um, because of identified the anoxic zone in, uh, uh, was a little undersized for the additional loads that we had um, into the treatment system. So, on, so, so sort of some of the things we're looking at to try to improve the performance, um, managing the dewater centrate coming into the, um, into the plant. Uh, we do wanna, we can see that right here with uh, our pumping of our, our uh, ammonia from uh, the dewatering, we, we're pumping as hard as we can here out of that pump, but we're seeing no effect in the effluent leaving or the ammonia trend leaving the, the IFAS. So we know we can take more there. So we wanna upsize that pump to deliver more um, during those time periods. And then we are gonna start doing, we do uh, have a tank to, uh, in our uh, headworks to start doing ammonia loading into the plant calculations real time. So um, we're looking to make a modification where we can actually add so, um, some abilities to control the amount of loading coming into the, the, the plant and maybe have a control scheme uh, uh, running, uh, helping us optimize the, the performance of the IFAS system off of that. Again, I talked a little earlier about we're, we're doing some uh, changing of the minimal uh, amount of air to, to go into each of the cells. So um, we're not wasting some of that air, uh, like I, I pointed out earlier. Um, evening out the ammonia load to aid in DO control a little, a little uh, about that with uh, that monitoring we do at the, the headworks. Um, ammonia control of IFAS, we do, we played with this off and on. We do, since we have that probe there, um, we could actually set a ammonia set point and have the, the blowers run off of that, uh, providing more air. Uh, that's the crucial thing about there is a lot, you know you got to do a lot of calibration on those and then the limitation on the the probes where they sort of fall asleep under two milligrams per liter has been a challenge. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, it's just uh, help with uh, the sludge settleability uh, issues we're having. Um, we really need to get control of that soluble CUD going into um, the, the IFAS zone. So a couple of things we've been looking at is um, this first idea was let's take these mixers that are the, in the anoxic zone and let's put them on a timer and turn them off and on um, and see if we can get some, encourage some bio P um, and increase the, the biomass in those cells to see if we can uh, maybe help those, those anoxic zones kick in more and, and uh, work more as a selector to get us a little better SVIs. Another, another idea here we're, we're, play, we're gonna try to play with is cell C, where we're, we have our mixic or recycle pumps pumping back up to the, the head of the, the basin. If we, if we did uh, added some control in which um, we turn off the air to this, this cell and maybe only have it come on occasionally to, to mix up that cell. Um, and 
we have those bypass pumps that uh, uh, are the bypass, uh, wet weather bypass, that, that will allow us to introduce PE into the outfall channel that goes directly into to cell C. So we could add some carbon in here with um, turning off those aerators, making it maybe an additional anoxic zone before it's pumped back up to the, the front of the basin. So we might add, be able to add that anoxic zone without you know, building a new tank um, is the hope there. So we'll, we'll play with that idea. And then the last one here, um, we do have a whole aeration basin here that PE is piped to. So the idea would be maybe we, could, we can fill that during the day, take, shave off the peak flow during the day and fill that and then reintroduce it back into the plant um, using the drains on the bottom of the basin and split that, that extra million gallons between the three in the evening when uh, the plant can handle it more and it give us a le less of a peak during the day. Yeah, so <clears throat> just quick summary. Uh, you, you know, Chris showed that first slide, but um, you can see in 2021, that's the plant effluent total nitrogen. So you can see it's, you know, hovering around two for the majority of the time, a couple bumps, uh, but really held to about 2.8 throughout the year, which was great. Um, so, you know, you pointed out the high carbon loads. It, it obviously is impacting capacity and, and certainly the bioreactors worked a little differently than expected. But, th that, I mean, there's no denying that's why they're getting really good total nitrogen. Um, and then I think this last slide. Just oh, shows is there the, one more? Yeah. Yeah, and this just shows, you know, uh, based on the findings, you know, re-rated the facility with the new wastewater characterization. You know, a neat, interesting, one of the big drivers was to add additional media when, um, you know, to add more capacity. Well, given the new uh, flows and loads, we don't need to add more media. Uh, the selectors actually proved to be limiting there together with some, you can see, secondary clarifiers, a few other things. But with that, um, yeah, any question for folks? And, and reminder, it's a live session. Mike in the center would be great. If folks have any questions for us. Looks like we finally have a chat One. question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the question in the chat is from Stuart Floss. Um, it says, great presentation, thank you. How did the IFAS operation work through the colder winter months and what changes, if any, did you make to optimize nitrification slash TIN? Read that one more time, the last part of it. What changes, if any, did you make to optimize nitrification? So I mean, in general, you know, the, To optimize nitrification within within the the IFAS basin, we you know, the the addition of the of the media, you know, was the biggest contribution to to being able to to um, op, or get better ammonia numbers out of the plant. During the winter, you know, we would just seasonally from one season to the next, maybe what the set points that seem to give us the best results. Um, out of the, the IFAS, but what really helped us is monitoring that those ammonia probes and knowing what was going on and having to wait for the, the composite to be analyzed and get the results the next day. We do still, you know, we mostly ran off of DO set point and adjusting that because of the need to always be going back and, and, and really checking that calibration and the limitations when it gets too low below two and not reading well, but uh, um, those are the tools we really have used to try to know, you know, do we need to adjust the DO set point in that? Um, one of the things I didn't mention is, you know, during that first phase um, where we only had aeration basin four, you know, there's times where we were adding so much air that we were blowing media out of the, the basin and over the screens. Um, that was one, you know, challenge, but once we went to 40%, we didn't, we didn't have any issues like that, but 
but I'd say, you know, to answer that question, for the most part, we're looking at, you know, looking at that ammonia leaving the, the IFAST and then adjusting our DO set point. Um, but we did play with uh, ammonia, uh, you know, using the ammonia to control. And I think we were pretty successful in time, at times there, but it was, you know, having that staff to go out and, and check on that calibration on the ammonia probe that was, was the, uh, probably the, the biggest reason why we more depend on the DO set point. Any other questions? Hi, uh, great presentation, uh, oh, Austin Carn, City of Boise. So we've experienced some of the same issues with with the ANISE probes and falling asleep. So mm -hmm. we actually started using uh, feed forward, where we would have an ammonia probe at the beginning of of our of coming out of our our anoxic zone, and mm -hmm. uh, we would do uptake testing. And so we would use it. We would use feed forward to say, you know, if we have so many pounds going into the system, we know we know what our our treatment capacity is so then we know if we need to turn we, we have a swing zone uh, rather than than ifast but we know hey yeah we have x amount of ammonia coming in we need to turn our swing zone on have you considered moving that probe from the end of the ifast to the beginning so you're you're more consistently in higher concentrations yeah i i think as a tool i would really still like, like to keep that ammonia probe at the outfall but we've talked about maybe adding additional one there since, but since we add, did add that ammonia probe at our head works, maybe we can do some a little feed for, uh, forward control based on what we know is coming into the plant is, is another option. But yeah, that definitely it would be no, nice to know what the ammonia load coming into the, that, that, um, into the zone, you know, know what's coming in, in and then what's going out would, would uh, be something that uh, uh, might be something we implement in the future. Yeah, Thank not that I don't know if you caught that. They, they just invested in putting in a new probe in the headworks just yeah, to okay. kind of help manage. But yeah, it'd be, it would be nice to know what amount of ammonia is actually getting there after the primer. Yeah. And we, so we, we put uh, wet chem analyzers on the, yeah. on the basin effluent uh, to, to be able to handle that really low concentration environment. Yeah. This is one of those things where you're bad. Uh, balancing, you know, other things that you think might optimize, optimize other, other uh, parts of the process. Um, but the, you know, we looked at the wet cam and, you know, the cost there is definitely something, you know, in the future, yeah. you know, that would give us the lower um, ability to lo uh, read those lower ammonia loads uh, and know where we're at. But, you know, right now with, with the probes we have, we felt well. They're they're good enough, but uh, you know, in the future, maybe those. That's what we do is is utilize a a technology that actually can get down there and read well between uh, zero and two. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. All right. <laughs> Thank you.